I've been dealing with um, the idea that pleasure is the only good in life, and in particular, I'm dealing with the fact that I don't believe people grasp what pleasure is or what um, modes of pleasure there are. Um, for example, um, I would assume that physical comfort, per the will to comfort that uh, Addendum brought up, um, sounds pretty physical to me. One could say that it might be will to mental or emotional comfort, which would be very interesting. I'd like to see the distinction between the two worked out because we know that they're not the same thing. For example, you can be physically completely comfortable but utterly prostrated by things like grief, depression, anxiety, um, whatever. Um, these are displeasures, aren't they? Being depressed is mighty unpleasurable. In fact, it's utterly anhedonic. <laughs> um, and uh, it's not nice. And there's a palpable negative to it, not just the absence of pleasures. Um, <clears throat> but uh, what I would posit is that view, uh, that narrowly defined view of pleasure, i.e., comfort, physical or mental comfort, only absence of negatives is incomplete and it's heavily uh, reliant upon a nasty fallacy which is a very tricky fallacy especially in light of the fact that we're so obsessed with the scientific method in the West here ie without evidence uh, we assume something we, we discount things uh, that's the evidence of absence fallacy. Absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. Um, and that's a tricky thing because the right going right out, right back to say Zopfe, where he posits the view that human beings have the capacity to imagine all these blissful exalted states, but we do not have the capacity to realize these exalted states. That is the sorry, kick the desk here. That is the absence of evidence or evidence of absence fallacy. He says boldly that we cannot achieve that exalted state which we can conceptualize. Prove it. Well, scientifically method wise you can't prove it, because you would have to deal with things like the inner life. Now I'm not referring here to anything spiritual, any sort of deus ex machina, or any, you know, Cartesian theater, or whatever. Um, I'm not referring to any spirit, any atman, any soul, anything like that. I'm referring to Schopenhauer's view of the inner life. Schopenhauer's view of life as an experience, as a will, as a representation, as um, a feeling. In other words, it's the old thing that I brought up. How do you wiggle your right toe? Well, you just wiggle it. You don't understand how you've actually just done that. You can explain it scientifically, but when there's any kind of volition, or even the appearance of volition here, and I'm not talking free will here, I'm just saying inner life, the way Schopenhauer describes it, the life that takes place at the experiential level that you are alone with, that you cannot share with other people. Um, that's what Tapi is saying, I think. He's saying that our experiential level doesn't really exist, uh, which even Schopenhauer disagrees with. I would say that the experience of everything is all that we have. Everything that we perceive, we perceive through our experiences. Therefore, everything out there in the world is, in a sense, again, this is Schopenhauer, a representation of that which is actually out there. Because we cannot see things but through our own biases. We can't see things but through our own experiences. Safe seems to imply that we cannot manipulate our experiences sufficiently to realize the exalted states that we can conceptualize. Um, I wonder about that, and I wonder why he says we cannot do it. How he can blurt that out and just let it sit there and nobody challenges it. Um, I follow sort of in a dilettantish 
kind of way compared to the real serious people. I follow, you know, a, a thing called Tantra. And at bottom, in my opinion, Tantra's main thrust is to, to, to work out or develop the aptitude or ability to manage and perhaps manipulate and perhaps control one's own experiences. Um, you can see how tricky a thing that would be. You're basically saying, I want to create the world that's around me. Because that which separates me from the world that's around me is my experience. And I want to control those experiences. <clears throat> At least I want a fair amount of my own input into those experiences. Something on the inner wants to control the, the tempo, I guess, by which information comes at it. Uh, otherwise, you have um, that horror of becoming thing. Just the constant flux of everything overwhelms the imagination and leads to things like existential horror and that kind of thing, where you simply can't cope with the amount of information blasting you right between the eyes at any given second of your life where consciousness itself becomes a terrible burden simply because you're being, as it were, subjected to an onslaught of information and sensations and experiences from the information stream. Tantra says, and many other life-affirming philosophies actually say, that you're not just a subject to all of this. You're not just, you know, you're not just being... Um, subjected to an onslaught of things. You can put your own input into this because the actual actual sort of meeting place between um, the outside and the inside, the outer and the inner life, again, Schopenhauer's inner life, I'm not talking spirit here, the outside and the inner life is your experiences. That's exactly where the two meet. If you can control or at least um, influence your experiences, then you've, in a way, disproven what Zapfe has said. The only problem is, of course, you can't prove to anybody else that you've disproven uh, Zapfe's um, evidence of absence. You can't really say that there is something else other than that. Equally, though, he can't say that there is nothing else other than, you know, brute physical facts. All of those rely upon experiences, and Zafi even admits as much when he says, actually experiencing reality without any control over it whatsoever would drive you crazy, probably. But we do have control over it. Um, the very fact that we can maintain our sanity, I think, proves that we have control over it, at least some control over it. It's when people sort of abdicate any idea that they have any control over their experiences at all that you become nothing more than a cork bobbing on the surface of a very stormy sea. Um, and you keep telling yourself, I have no control over this. I am a victim of reality. I'm subjected to reality. I have no influence over this whatsoever. You're doing that to yourself, I'm afraid. And you're doing it based on a dangerously literal um, attachment or literal, I would say, making a religion out of the scientific method and evidence of, uh, or sorry, burden of proof and things like that. Not everything that takes place can be proven. I think that we know that. And at the level of experience or at the level of Schopenhauer's inner life, you can't prove anything. You can hint at things. Any emotion, any feeling, any experience can be faked, at least in terms of trying to convince somebody else. That's the kind of thought that goes through every guy's mind when the woman underneath you is moaning a little bit too loudly. Is she just doing this? <laughs> You'll never know. Who cares? It's wonderful, isn't it? <laughs>